Hello, I'm Patrice Demers Caneda, author of A Tale of Two Migrations, a French Canadian Odyssey. And I am of French Canadian descent. The first migration was from Dieppe in Normandy and many other places in Canada, in, pardon, in, in France, to Quebec. And the second migration was when the uh, French came from Canada to the New England states. But today I would like to talk about founding mothers. And if ever there was a country that should, should recognize founding mothers, it was La Nouvelle France or French Canada. And I'm going to start with the 18th century and tell you a little bit about these founding mothers. Um, first, they were mostly from the area of Paris. And I will speak of four women in particular uh, and set the stage for you about what Paris was like in the mid 18th century. Paris was the city of lights under Louis XIV. It was the most sophisticated city in Europe. It had public transportation, grand houses, magnificent architecture, beautiful transportation, coaches, public transportation. That was an, really a remarkable thing. The bridges were bridges with places for pedestrians to walk across even at night. There were vendors everywhere and high fashion. So imagine these women going from Paris to the land that was called La Nouvelle France, a land of fur trappers, of fishermen, cod fishermen, the land that where Samuel Champlain was deemed the father of La Nouvelle France. Native Americans, uh, the fur trappers, uh, were in the beaver hat industry, in beaver trapping, and beaver hats were all the fashion all over Europe. So there were people making money, but there were just men. There were no women in La Nouvelle France, except for the Aboriginal women. So after years of the settlement not getting very far, in 1610, Samuel Champlain rushed to France and decided to be married. But he had a very mercenary idea. He wanted a dowry. He wanted the dowry. So he became engaged to a young woman whose name was Hélène Boulet, and she was 12 years old. Her father was very wealthy. Champlain had been a friend of the family. She was in a fury about her fate. Her dowry was 4,500 leaves. And he went back to Canada with the money, and she stayed in, in France uh, for, uh, and didn't go until 1620, 10 years later, very reluctantly. She stayed there from 1620 to 1624, and then back to France she went, and he died in, 19, in 1635. At that time, she joined the Ursuline nuns in Paris, and later founded a convent. She died in March 1648 at the age of 56. Well, she was a founding mother in the sense that her dowry gave Champlain enough money to keep the colony going. So we should recognize her for her courage in that sense. Now we'll go on to a few other women who were fantastic and very interesting. The first one I'd like to talk to you about was Jeanne Mance. She lived in the golden age, in the reign of Louis XIV, as we've described. She, she was wealthy. She was a beautiful young woman with long flowing hair, daughter of a lawyer, second of 12 children born in the Champagne region. She was inspired by her cousin, who was a missionary priest, she was an eloquent speaker and an ascetic who lived on bread and water. At this time in France, 
there was a great fervor for Catholicism. And the Edict of Nantes that had protected Protestants in the past had been revoked. And many, many Huguenots left. They were Protestants. And, or they were persecuted. So these ascetics came up and saw visions and heard, read books about Canada, which were written, many, some by Champlain, read books about the les sauvages, as they called them, savages. They didn't mean them that in a derogatory way. They meant savage in the sense that they lived in the forests. But she was inspired, as I said, by her cousin who was a missionary priest. And all she wanted to do was go to Canada, to the New World. So she met Madame de Bouillon, who was a very wealthy woman. And this woman raised funds, had raised funds for the Society of Notre Dame de Montréal. And these were people who, at this time, Quebec was the only city. These were people who wanted to found another city further west on the, on the, the Isle of uh, Montréal. And it was a very, very dangerous place. But their fervor went west, and they wanted to save as many people as they possibly could, save the souls of as many people as they possibly could. At the same time, it was really about trade and enterprise. There was a problem. The Iroquois, who were the strongest Native Americans in North America, amazing warriors, healthy, handsome, intelligent, with a great aim, who'd already managed rifles from the Dutch, were sharpshooters, not, not a simple enemy. And they were allied with the English in the fur trade. And going to Montreal was getting a little too close for comfort. And the Hurons and the Algonquins, which are sometimes referred to as the good Indians or the Christian Indians, were allied with Champlain. And they were quick to join the French because they needed an ally. And they hoped that they would be protected from the Iroquois. So she met Maisonneuve. And his goal was to turn it in Montreal Island into a missionary hub for converting the Aboriginal people. And in 1639, she left for Quebec with a few Jesuits. And the second woman that we'll be talking about, who is Mary de la Incarnacion, whom she will help eventually to found a school for young Indian and French girls. So once they arrived in Quebec, Mary stayed there, but Mance and her companions went to the Isle of Montreal. And it was a wilderness, and there they pitched tents. They began living in the woods, 55 of them, 10 women, and they stayed through the winter, which was remarkable if you know anything about Canadian winters. Eventually, they built a small hospital, took care of sick Hurons and French who were injured by the Iroquois. A third of the colonists were slain. She convinced Governor Maisonneuve to go back to France to ask her benefactor for more funds, and she used the funds to bring more soldiers for protection. In 1653, relief arrived. That saved the settlement. And here is where my ancestors get into it. My ancestor, Jean de Mers, who was born in Dieppe, married Jean Vedi that very next year in Montreal. So now, after my research, I have an idea of what they went through and went to and what courage that must have taken. Remember that relief came in 1653, that meant soldiers arrived. 
and they were there in 1654, getting married on September 11th. So in 59, Mance went back. The, you know, these people were crossing the ocean that had icebergs, danger, ships crashing, and they went back periodically on, on, with their missions. In 1659, she went to France and brought back three more sisters. So just a few years ago, Jeanne Mance was at, at least given the title co-founder of Montreal, and well, she deserved it. Uh, she was the founder of Hotel Dieu, Montreal's very first hospital, which is still there. And in the front of the hospital, there's a huge statue of Jean Mance. So now we'll talk about Blessed Mary de Lin the Incarnation, the mother of the Canadian church. And she was uh, beatified by Pope Paul II. Her name was Marie Gouillard. She was intent from her childhood on belonging to Christ. At age 14, she asked her parents if she could enter an abbey. Her parents were totally against such an idea, and her father refused to let her go. Instead, she was married to Claude Martin, a forced marriage. He was a master silk worker. He was a good man, and she, according to her own account, she had a happy marriage. And within two years, she had a son, also named Claude. But her husband died only months after the birth of her son, leaving her a widow at the age of 19. With her husband's death, Marie inherited his failing business, which she then lost, moved back into her parents' home, where they were trying desperately to get her to remarry again, got out of there so she wouldn't have to be married again, and instead moved in with her sister and brother-in-law and helped uh, with their transportation business. Nothing could distract her from her spiritual life. I was constantly occupied by my intense concentration on God, she wrote. Over time, her inclination toward religious life only grew and eventually led her to enter the Ursuline convent on January 25th, 1631. She left her son behind. And it said that periodically he, he would go to he would go to the convent and pound on the doors and beg for his mother, but she insisted on the religious life. She saw visions. She sometimes called the little Saint Teresa, um, and she found many spiritual connections with Teresa. She was heavily influenced by her work, especially the book Avila and she long aspired to the same goal of traveling to the new world and becoming a martyr. She saw things all the time. She said, I saw at some distance to my left a little church of white marble. The Blessed Virgin was seated. She was holding the child Jesus in her lap. This place was elevated, and below it lay a majestic and vast country full of mountains, of valleys, of thick mists, which permeated everything except the church. The Blessed Virgin, Mother of God, looked down on this country as pitiable as it was awesome. It seemed to me that she spoke about this country and about myself, and that she had a plan that involved me. She identified the place to be Canada and was on her way. In 1631, after working with a spiritual director for many years, she, uh, that was when she really got her vocation. And later, when her son had become a Benedictine monk, they corresponded candidly about their spiritual and emotional trials. The third woman, is Madame de la Peltrie. And Marie recognized, she met this, this religiously devoted widow, another woman widowed at a very early e year, uh, yes. She was the daughter of a fiscal officer. And, and Marie thought, maybe this is the woman who was in my vision. We've got to get together. 
So De La Peltry's contribution to the endeavor was met with strong opposition from her aristocratic family. To garner their support, she arranged a sham marriage. They were pushing her to marry after she'd been widowed. Enough of that. So she arranged a marriage with Mr. Christian Jean de Brunier. He pretended to be her fiance. And her new marital status gave her the legal authority to sign over the bulk of her estate to the Ursuline order. Therefore, she, thereby fully funding the mission. They soon erected a three-story stone convent near the house of their patron, Madame de la Peltry. There were also teepees of the Algonquins who sent their daughters to the convent for instruction. So as these three women made their mark in Montreal and in Quebec, a new scheme came about. The, there was a very big problem because there were not enough women and the, the colony was not growing and they were in competition with New England where families had arrived and the population was growing. Talon, who was the minister to the king, had a brilliant idea. He said, we will recruit women to go to Canada as wives and we will call them les filles du roi, daughters of the king. These women will receive a dowry and then perhaps we, we will have wives for all these men who are already there. By this time, there were soldiers, there were aristocrats who had gone into business, there were couteurs du bois who were the fur trappers, and they did not have wives. There were a few marriages among the fur trappers and the uh, Huron and Algonquin women and yet the majority of the men were not married. So Talon had this great scheme and it lasted for 10 years from 1663 to 1673. And I will find the notice for you that was put out in the streets of Paris. Here it is. Wanted by request of King Louis XIV, daughters of the king, 1,000 strong women of marriageable age, 14 to 40, to go to New France as brides. The following will be accepted. Orphans and widows, a girl accompanied by one parent, no girl going to join a fiancé or husband will be accepted. Upon the signing of a marriage contract in New France, a dowry will be presented along with a sum of up to 200 francs. If you are of good health and good morals, go to the king's agent at City Hall. And so it was, and many brave young women made that journey to the new world. And if you're a descendant of the millions of French descendants, you have these women to thank for it because they produce children and otherwise there would have not been a French Canada. So in our next video, I will tell you the story of these brave women. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Bye.